tonight. I'm here to talk about the ABC of National Liberation Movements by Hal Draper. Um, to, uh, so here's a quick outline. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hal Draper, the author, then go through the pamphlet in, in detail, and then wrap up with some recent examples that uh, uh, are, you know, we should discuss. So Hal Draper was a Marxist activist, historian, and writer born in Brooklyn in 1914 to Jewish immigrants from Ukraine. He was a lifelong advocate of what he called socialism from below and one of the creators in the early 40s of the third camp Marxist tradition, which rejected the camps of both capitalism and Stalinism. Uh, the, the, the slogan, neither Washington nor Moscow, but international socialism, expressed the third camp view that the Cold War was an inter-imperial conflict. This view, in turn, framed their approaches to the national liberation movements that arose in the Cold War context. The third camp represented a political break with Trotsky, who characterized the USSR as a degenerated worker state that had to be defended against Western imperialism and overthrown by political revolution to defeat the Stalinist bureaucracy. By contrast, uh, Draper and other Trotskyist dissidents argued that the USSR had become a new form of class society characterized variously uh, by Draper as uh, bureaucratic collectivism and by other uh, that he was close to by as state capitalism. Uh, it had to be overthrown by social revolution, not a mere political one, because a new class would need to take power. The same applied to the states set up by the USSR in, the, in Eastern Europe after World War II and to states organized in a similar way like Mao's China. By 1964, Draper was a librarian at UC Berkeley, where he helped found the Independent Socialist Club, which played a, a leading role in Berkeley's free speech movement and the anti-Vietnam War movement. In this period, Draper wrote the invaluable pamphlet, Two Souls of Socialism, at a time when various top-down socialisms were in vogue, including social democracy, Stalinism, Maoism, and anarchism, uh, two Souls stood apart by emphasizing bottom-up socialism, workers' self-emancipation. In 1968, the Independent Socialist Club expanded nationally and became the International Socialists. Three years later, in the denouement of the radical 60s, Draper made a dramatic turn on the question of organization. He quit the IS, claiming it had embraced dual unionism and become a microsect and he turned away from organized socialism altogether and spent the rest of his life working as an independent scholar. Uh, in a uh, 1973 pamphlet uh, called Anatomy of a Microsect, Draper argued that the road to, revolutionary, to a revolutionary party was not through what he called sects, membership organizations based on a well-defined program, but through a, quote, political center built around a publication. In rightly rejecting vulgar vanguardism, Draper overcorrected and rejected organization altogether. The pamphlet makes unsubstantiated claims that ignore the path taken by the European social movement and the Bolsheviks, as well as the failure of political centers like Monthly Review and Dissent to create a mass party. Marxist ideas, including Draper's, are indispensable to the fight for socialism. Given a mass readership and popular support, they're even better, but still insufficient. Marxist ideas can only become a material factor in struggle if they are debated, developed, and translated into action by cadre trained in organizations based on those ideas. In 1977, a faction within the International Socialists was expelled and formed the International Socialist Organization, our direct predecessor organization, or one of them. Uh, 42 years later, in, in 2019, when the ISO was collapsing, Draper's Anatomy of a Microsect pamphlet was passed around like a bomb to set off, uh, set, set off to finish the job. Draper's crowning intellectual and political achievement was his multi-volume treatise, Karl Marx's Theory of Revolution, published in the 70s and 80s. 
It is a reevaluation of the whole of, of Marx's political theory based on an exhaustive survey of the writings of both Marx and Engels. Um, but uh, tonight we want to go back a few years to 1969 when Draper was still active in the International Socialists and the anti-war movement. He wrote this pamphlet, uh, The ABC of National Liberation Movements. The pamphlet provides a methodology to guide revolutionaries through the Vietnam War most immediately, but also a variety of political situations, including wars, civil wars, national liberation movements, and even progressive mass movements. The pamphlet most specifically sought to answer the question, what attitude should revolutionary socialists in the U.S. adopt toward political groups leading struggle in countries subject to U.S. domination? In 1969, this was a vexing question for Draper's audience, the socialists in and around the International Socialists. Uh, of course, they all opposed U.S. intervention and demanded its unconditional withdrawal from Vietnam. But they also knew that if victorious, the Stalinist National Liberation Front and Stalinist North Vietnam would establish an unde undemocratic authoritarian one-party state uh, preventing the independent organization of workers, peasants, and the oppressed. And when victorious, they did just that. Uh, but before 1968, the, the ISC or IS position, uh, Draper's organization's position, had been one of no support to the National Liberation Front. But after the 1968 Tet Offensive, they offered military support to the NLF while continuing to oppose it politically. The Tet Offensive had shown that the NLF had the support of the overwhelming Vietnamese majority, who correctly saw it as the only force left to deal with U.S. imperialism. There was no independent movement of workers and peasants, no third camp for Marxists to support. At the same time, the war had gone from prim being primarily a civil war to a war of national independence. As such, it demanded the military support of socialists in the U.S., all sentiment against uh, U.S. imperialism and its client regime in South Vietnam now had to be channeled through the NLF, according to uh, Draper and crew. Uh, I'm not sure I agree that the national liberation struggle only became primary in 1968, to be honest. Um, uh, what we in the U.S. call the Vietnam War should be considered a continuation of Vietnam's 1946 to 54 war of uh, national liberation against the French um, the U.S. just replaced the French through puppet regimes that were not militarily or politically viable apart from the U.S., so um, that's something I wanted to raise. Uh, following, uh, following the Prussian military strategist Klaus, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, the Marxist tradition defines war as the continuation of politics by other means, namely violent means. As Lenin said, politics is the reason and war is only the tool, not the other way around. Our attitude toward war must be congruent with our attitude toward the politics of which it is a continuation. This is the basis for whether we should support or oppose a war uh, rather than primarily our opinion of the people, the government, or the class leading the fight, though those con considerations are relevant to how we support or oppose a war. Uh, according to Draper. In an armed struggle, uh, if an armed struggle, sorry, if an armed struggle is decisively a continuation of resistance to imperialist impression, then it is decisively a war of national liberation and deserves the support of revolutionary socialists. A national liberation struggle, though, can be swallowed up and overshadowed by an inter-imperialist conflict so that it is impossible to support the national liberation struggle with a, without supporting an imperialist side. Uh, two initial examples that the Draper deals with. One is Serbia in 1914. Uh, Marxists supported the Serbian people's right to independence from its imperialist oppressor, Austria-Hungary, but the Serbian national liberation struggle was completely integrated into the camp of the Allies. When Austria-Hungary invaded Serbia, Russia came to Serbia's defense, and the situation spiraled into World War I. Uh, the UK, Russia, and France justified their bloody inter-imperialist conflict with the German-Austrian bloc by cynically raising the slogan of Serbian self-determination. 
When this happened, Marxists opposed that slogan and instead fought against both sides in the war. It was a, if a call for self-determination of a nation is used primarily to back the interests of one imperialist power against another, Marxists must oppose it. And uh, I just want to note that I'm following Draper and using the terms Marxists, revolutionary socialists, and independent socialists. Uh, he, he uses those terms throughout this pamphlet um, to mean uh, not Stalinist, Maoist, social democrats, or, or even orthodox Trotskyists in some cases, but third camp Trotskyists uh, who had a, you know their own position on these things, who have their own. Uh, all right. Uh, so the second example that he gives is uh, Spain, uh, the Spanish Civil War, and uh, it was decisively a continuation of the politics of the defense of a democratic republic against a fascism. Uh, so Democrat, uh, so so I'm sorry, Marxists supported it, the the, the war, the national liberation struggle. Uh, uh, many foreign socialists and communists organized to fight for the republic directly. Uh, but there was also an inter-imperial aspect. Germany and Italy fought alongside Franco, and Russia supported the republic. Um, it was a localized hot, hot war in the midst of an inter-imperial cold war, but it never spilled over into a world war like Serbia. So Marxists continued to support it. Uh, they were able to support one side. Um, imperialist antagonisms are inevitably reflected in local conflicts, but they do not necessarily determine the character of those conflicts. So why do Marxists who are internationalists opposed to all borders support national liberation? Uh, put differently, how does national liberation or self-determination or independence relate to the politics of revolutionary socialism? Uh, because they are democratic demands, Draper says, the, the fulfillment of which is necessary for a world in which human potential can flourish. We support national self-determination even under undemocratic national governments, as is always the case. Uh, and we support bourgeois democratic demands, even if they're unrelated to the further struggle for socialist democracy, though they are always related to that. Uh, sooner or later, democratic demands from national liberation to the rights to speak, assemble, and combine, sooner or later they facilitate the struggle for socialist democracy. Imperialist domination in inhibits class struggle within the oppressed nation. This is another reason why we're, uh, you know, support national liberation struggles. Uh, imperialist domination obscures, distorts, and dampens class antagonisms that bear revolutionary potential. National liberation provides the conditions for that potential to blossom. National oppression divides the working class uh, uh, of the oppressor nation from the working class of the oppressed nation, and it binds the working class to the ruling class in both nations. These divisions and, and bonds can only be overcome if the working class in the oppressor nation fights for the self-determination of the oppressed nation. Support for national liberation is therefore an essential part of internationalism. The rise of imperialism made this question central to socialist strategy. Uh, Marxists distinguish between military support and political support for a government, party, or other political organization leading a struggle. Offering military but not political support is how we support a war whose politics we agree with, but whose leadership we oppose. Political support during an armed national struggle is determined by the same considerations as during an election. We do not give political support simply because an organization, movement, or government receives mass support, is an enemy of our enemy, adopts a political program that is superficially unobjectionable, or receives support from better political elements than its own leadership. We only give political support on the basis of, in Draper's words, the real political character and real political program of an organization, movement, or government. Military support is about which side we want to win militarily and which we want to lose. Uh, like political support, military support is determined by political 
considerations, not military ones. After the 1917 revolution in Russia, the Bolsheviks drew this important distinction and thus militarily collaborated with the provisional government to prevent a reactionary coup while avoiding the trap of supporting the, the provisional government, which was hostile to Soviet power and intent on continuing the First World War. Uh, so Draper offers the following examples of struggles that Marxists supported militarily, but not politically. Uh, so first was uh, China versus Japan in the in the 30s, 1931 to 37. When, when Japanese imperialism invaded Manchuria and threatened to take over all of China, Marxists gave military support to China, despite the fact that Chiang, uh, Chiang Kai-shek's regime and uh, had supported and massacred workers and specifically communists and did not represent a democratic social force. Uh, when Mussolini invaded and occupied Ethiopia, Ethiopia was an incredibly reactionary, slave-dependent society, even more regressive than fascist Italy, uh, Draper says. And an Ethiopian victory couldn't be expected to facilitate progressive struggle in Ethiopia, but an Italian victory would inhibit progressive struggle in Italy and help consolidate and spread fascism. So Marxists militarily supported Ethiopia. Stalin's Russia, on the other hand, uh, supplied oil to Mussolini's war machine, by the way. Uh, so uh, the next example is uh, to return to the Spanish Civil War. Uh, revolutionary socialists could not give political support to the bourgeois Republican government that was attacked by Franco's fascism. It was imperialist and brutally repressive of workers. And revolutionaries couldn't trust the Republican bourgeoisie to fight Franco to the end, nor by revolutionary means. But the situation demanded military support, which anarchists and Trotskyists provided directly in the form of independent fighting forces, the CNT, FAI, and the PUM battalions. Uh, these forces operated under their own command and were unsubordinated to the political control of the government while collaborating with its military forces. Revolutionaries outside Spain sent material aid to these independent detachments rather than to the government. Through these independent armed forces, the Spanish left was able to compete not only for leadership of the struggle, but for a different goal for it, to go beyond the fight against Franco and a return to the bourgeois status quo, to social revolution, uh, which was the only thing in the end that could defeat uh, fascism in Spain. Uh, Al, uh, so, so Marxists supported Algeria's national liberation struggle against French colonialism, but there were two rival movements fighting for independence, the Stalinist back FLN, uh, or national liberation front and the, and the MNA, the Algerian national movement, the FLN fought militarily fought and ultimately eliminated the MNA and upon expulsion of France established a, a, an authoritarian one-party state. Marxists gave military support to the Algerian struggle without giving political support to the FLN. And I just wanted to say I selected this photo uh, uh, from the time uh, because it raised the same slogan that we just raised uh, about Aaron Bushnell, uh, glory to our martyrs. Uh, so in 1948, Marxists viewed Tito's, Yugos, Tito's break with the Soviet Union as a continuation of Yugoslavia's move for national independence from Russia. Uh, they were for its military defense without giving political support to Tito. A conquest by Russia would divert Yugoslavia's internal social antagonisms to the national question, uh, quote unquote, delaying the reckoning. Um, this process was... This exact process was seen later in 1956 Poland when revolutionary potential was short-circuited by counterposing the national question to the social question. So here's another kind of you know big lesson that, that Draper tries to give us. National oppression militates against the resolving of social issues by revolutionary means. Um, so Marxists condemned and wished for the defeat of the U.S. invasion of Cuba. They were for they were for the military support of Cuba without giving political support to Castro. 
the national liberation element was dominant despite the Cold War forming the backdrop. The conquest of Cuba would have paved the way for more U.S. invasions and increased reaction in, in the U.S. In Cuba, it would have dampened demands for democratization and bound workers to the Castro regime and intensified its authoritarianism. In most, uh, so a couple of notes on, on this section. In, in most of the cases considered here, it was impossible for revolutionaries to, to coexist and collaborate with the leaders of the national struggle. In some cases, leaders would sooner kill revolutionaries than the imperialist enemy. Additionally, we often take positions that are we are we are unable to act upon materially. Uh, the point of taking such positions is propagandistic rather than a matter of agitation or action, uh, which is not to say any less important. Um, so on to the Vietnam War, the kind of uh, you know big example here. Uh, the Vietnam War was a, a civil war and an imperialist intervention. Uh, the Spanish Civil War was too, but the imperial element, imperialist element uh, remained subordinate. And the Algerian struggle included both a, a civil war element uh, uh, and, and a national liberation element, but neither side was, was, in power, uh, was tied to French imperialism. So it made it a little easier um, to understand. Uh, after, but after the expulsion of the French in 1954, South Vietnam was ruled by a uh, what Draper calls a landlord, usurer, comprador, militarist clique of authoritarians, uh, um, the, you know, the client state of South Vietnam. Uh, and it was supported by U.S. imperialism. On the other hand, North Vietnam was ruled by Ho Chi Minh's re uh, regime that represented a new exploitative system that Draper calls bureaucratic or totalitarian or totalitarian collectivism. It would uh, th that regime would sooner make a deal with imperialists than collaborate with revolutionary socialists. In fact, previously the regime had systematically assassinated Trotskyists even before fighting the French and their collaborators. Third, so third camp Trotskyists held no illusions in North Vietnam or the NLF, unlike much of the left which apologized for them or the Maoists and Orthodox Trotskyists who considered them to be socialists. In such a civil war between two reactionary political forces, revolutionaries offered neither military nor political support to either side, but looked to organize independent forces and offer critical support to any quote, revolutionary democratic elements, uh, like, like the Buddhist-led revolts that, that occurred in Vietnam in the 50s and 60s. Russia and Chinese involvement was limited to supplying arms, whereas the U.S. conducted large scale, a large-scale military invasion. The war was a continuation of the politics of U.S. imperialism's policing of the world against the Stalinist camp and popular revolution. In 1956, when, when, uh, while U.S. intervention in Vietnam was limited to money, material, and some military advisors, the Civil War aspect was dominant in Draper's estimation. Uh, but by 1968, the U.S. was doing the bulk of the fighting, so the imperialist national liberation aspect became dominant. A, quanti a quantitative increase in U.S. military operations brought about a qualitative change in the war. This was revealed by the Tet Offensive. The South Vietnam Vietnamese people demonstrated overwhelming allegiance to the NLF uh, during this offensive, uniting behind the only force that could fight the imperialist invasion. Marxists remain, remained politically opposed to the NLF. They did not politically glorify or foster illusions in them, nor turn them into a symbol of the struggle for Vietnamese self-determination, like the Stalinists and naive liberals did, according to Draper. Telling the truth about the NLF was also political preparation for the next possible stage, struggle against the Stalinists in power. From a third camp perspective, there was no third camp to support in Vietnam, no proletarian organization or movement. The South Vietnamese regime and its patrons, its U.S. patrons, uh, eliminated the revolutionary and democratic alternatives. Uh, the Stalinists reaped the fruits of this reactionary policy. Stalinist domination became the lesser evil to foreign domination when the choice was narrowed down to those two options. 
Stalinism feeds on the crimes of Western imperialism, or did, uh, to, to channel discontent into support of its regimes, just as U.S. reaction did with the crimes of Stalinism. The curbing of U.S. imperialism is in, was and is uh, remains essential for any revolutionary development. The methodology put forth in Draper's 55-year-old pamphlet remains useful. Many socialists continue to make one of two errors. On the one hand, accommodation to Western imperialism or Zionism. On the other hand, campism, meaning uncritical political support given to any country or movement that opposes Western imperialism, no matter how reactionary they might be. To briefly consider some recent examples, uh, Syria 2011, socialists influenced by campism refused to extend solidarity or even to recognize the organic and mass character of the protests and uprisings against the authoritarian Assad regime. The Party for Socialism and Liberation, the PSL, supported Assad and, and Russian intervention in Syria. They denied reports of Assad's use of chemical weapons and called Syrians in revolt pawns in a U.S. game. In Hong Kong 2019, despite some heroic fighters on our side, as seen here, the so-called water revolution never approached civil war status. Still, the same political methodology should guide us. We considered the protests to be a progressive mass movement by completely valid revolutionary subjects, students mostly, uh, but the enemy of my enemy types predictably saw only an imperialist plot against communist China. In Iran 2022, it was the same story with the protests sparked by the police murder of Gina Amini. Uh, we supported the combined struggle for gender liberation, for Kurdish national liberation, and against the police and authoritarian rule. Tankies saw a color revolution. Woman life freedom... Not today, CIA. And then uh, to U Ukraine, uh, 2014. I, I I adjusted the date uh, to the uh, you know invasion of Crimea. Um, so while Radlib, Stalinists, Maoists, and some Trotskyists apologize for Putin, we support the Ukrainian people's national liberation struggle against Russia's imperialist annexationist invasion. But the inter-imperialist dimension, the competition between the U.S. and Russia, dominates here. The Ukrainian state and the fight against Russia is completely integrated into the camp of the U.S. and EU, as Draper said about Serbia and the Allied camp during World War I. As such, U.S. socialists should not offer military support to Ukraine, though some have. Uh, but I also want to say that we supported, we have supported worker to worker aid efforts that sent convoys of aid, that send convoys of aid, including weapons from trade unions in France and Poland to trade unions in Ukraine, supplying the front lines and others suffering under the invasion. Uh, but, but that is more propaganda than direct action. There is no effective third camp. Uh, it's more an expression of a political position. Uh, so th that brings us to the last example, Palestine, and I started with 1917, the Balfour Declaration, not 1948, the actual um, founding of the Israeli state. Um, so uh, we have supported, we do support the leaders of the Palestinian National Liberation Struggle, Hamas, uh, militarily, but not politically. Uh, and uh, by the way, we have no way of acting on our military support, FBI. So um, it's just a political position if you're listening. Um, so, uh, but some U.S. socialists have not only refused to militarily support Hamas, but have condemned it. Uh, others have gone too far the other way and offered not only military, but political support, which expresses itself as uncritical support or the fetishization of Hamas. Uh, so in conclusion, when faced with a false dilemma between our own, in quotes, ruling class and, and that ruling class's enemies, who are other ruling classes, <laughs> uh, we must say a plague on both your houses. Uh, that's what Marx said. 
quoting Shakespeare, of course, uh, re or referring to Shakespeare uh, during the 1870 Franco-Prussian War. And uh, as French communist uh, Louis-Auguste Blanqui said, we are always and everywhere with the oppressed and against the oppressors. Uh, and I would just add, no matter what flag they fly, class independent politics is a prerequisite for the advancement of class struggle, for socialism, and ultimately for survival on this planet. <laughs>